Colorado, which isn't too far, and that was pretty nice. Didn't even need AC there. So. All right, uh, Eastwood family and friends, let's go ahead and uh, sing a song as we begin here tonight. Uh, Royal, let's uh, go ahead and boot that up. Let's do the Glory Land Way. The Glory Land uh, Way, first, second, and third verses. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the Glory Land Way. Telling the world that Jesus saves today. Yes, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way grow with clearer. For I'm in the glory land way. List to the call, the gospel call today. Get in the glory land way. Wonders come home, oh, hasten to obey. For I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way grow it clearer for I'm in the glory land way. Onward I go rejoicing in his love. I'm in the glory land way. Soon I shall see him in that home above. Oh, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way grow and clearer. For 
I'm in the glory land way. All right, let's go ahead and do our family announcements here. First of all, got some good news. Wanda Schmitz is home following a procedure that she had at St. Francis in Wichita. She did have a few minor strokes, and they found out it was a condition of her heart, and so she's being monitored on that. Sister Janice Bonham is at home with hospice care that's coming in three times a week, and now a, a friend is also staying with her while Jason has to do some of his uh, lawn care throughout the day. David Bartlett will have leg surgery Friday in Wichita. We were informed that John Lowen had a fall and has a broken hip following that fall, but he is at home. Cynthia Moravic shared with us a prayer request for her sister Judith and her Aunt Lucy, who both have COVID-19 in Peru. Lucy is Paula's sister. Please also keep Paula and the family and uh, her sister Judith in all of our prayers. Services for Hiram Love are going to be this Saturday at 10 o'clock here at the Eastwood Building. And we want to continue to remember Sister Doris. Nita Von Zeke uh, passed away this uh, past Saturday. Uh, services were this morning in McPherson. Brooklyn Boyer, of course, that's uh, Floyd Boyer's uh, granddaughter, continues to need our prayers as she recovers from a swimming pool accident. This Sunday, worship and Bible classes, all children um, going in through the first through the fourth grades will meet in the fellowship hall. All children going into the fifth and sixth grades will go into their regular classrooms. All adults will meet in the auditorium at 10 a.m. Worship times are 9 and 11 with 11 uh, clock services that are going to be uh, streaming online. The Wurz Arnold and Bugland Life Group they are going to meet in the Fellowship Hall at 5 p.m. this Sunday evening, so all are welcome to join with them in that life group meeting. And then Dave and Ruthie had some good news they wanted to announce. They're celebrating their 14th wedding anniversary here tonight, so we rejoice and are thankful for them. Now let's go ahead and introduce our speaker here tonight. We are blessed to have Warren Baldwin with us. Warren's been preaching the gospel for 38 years. He's preached in Florida, Wyoming, and Kansas. He and his wife Cheryl have been in Ulysses, Kansas for 20 years. The Baldwins have three children, all whom are married. They have two grandsons, one two and a, and a half years old and one six months old. Warren is an active as a teacher, counselor at Silver Maple Bible Camp. He serves on the board. He and his wife also are involved in two family camps, Red River Family Camp in Red River, New Mexico, and Yellowstone Bible Camp uh, in, I like this, Pray, Montana, P-R-A-Y, Montana. Warren is the author of two books on Proverbs and is currently uh, writing a book on parenting and a book on marriage, and he conducts seminars on Proverbs and church leadership, and uh, we were informed that you're going to be teaching the men's class in the morning at 8 o'clock to come here uh, Warren in the morning. Personally, I always get something out of any lesson or sermon that Warren either teaches or preaches, and I'm always so thankful for the opportunity to hear his presentation. He has a kind and scholarly Bible demeanor about him, and so Warren, we want to invite you to come up and share with us on improving your marriage here this evening. And I'm always very encouraged when I'm in your presence, and thank you for your kind words. And it's good to be with all of you tonight. <clears throat> this is on improving your marriage, but I'm also calling it a blessed fountain because of a verse we're going to read in just a moment. In fact, let's start out with that. Proverbs chapter 5 and verse 15. Proverbs 5 and verse 15. And I was here last year and enjoyed being with you and recognized several faces from last year. And also some from, my, from camp and maybe youth rallies. We don't have that many youth rallies, I don't think, because we used, we used to have the big statewide youth rally, and I really miss that. Got to see a lot of people there. But good to see all of you again. Proverbs 5, verse 15. <clears throat> Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Now, just to start out, the, 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 the uh, word water or flowing cistern, anything having to do with water, 
is a metaphor in, in the Old Testament for the love relationship between a husband and wife. It really comes up as well in uh, Song of Songs, the idea of quenching thirst. And the love relationship quenches our hunger for love and acceptance in the same way that water does when we are thirsty from the hot sun. So this is a metaphor. So leading into this, we know that this is not just about turning the cold water on or putting ice in your water. This is about a, a re, just as much a refreshment, but of romantic love and connection between husband and wife. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be for yourself alone and not to be shared with you, uh, not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving deer, a graceful doe, let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? And then there follows three verses of warning. This is a very erotic section of Proverbs. And by erotic, I don't mean in a bad way. We're used to hearing that word in a bad way. But in the ancient, term, ancient use, it simply meant... You know, it was of, of love, sexuality. It had to do with giving. We associate it now with selfishness, but this word erotic is used in very positive ways in the Old Testament and in the Bible, at least in the Greek version of the Old Testament, because it addressed God's plan for a husband and wife to find enjoyment and fulfillment, to have children, but the complete enjoyment of their lives together for a lifetime. If you caught the phrase here, rejoice in the wife of your youth. Now, my wife and I have been married for 38 years. So we're not in our 20s anymore. We're not in our 30s anymore. We're not in our 40s anymore. We're not in our 50s anymore. We're just barely in that other decade, just barely. 38 years. We're not youth. But who is the wife of my youth? You know, she will always be the wife of my youth. We will never have another youth. We will never have a chance to go back and redo our 20s and 30s. She will always be the wife of my youth. And the admonition from Solomon here is, always remember her. And I remember reading years ago that something a husband ought to do is keep a picture of his wife from, of when she was a little girl and keep that on his desk or somewhere because that's how her father sees her. And that's not how I see my wife. I see my wife the first time I saw her in college. And I went, oh, Ooh. You know, she was walking with another girl that I knew. My, my, my wife came in, I think, my junior year. She was a sophomore transfer. She was walking with another girl that was a sophomore junior. So I saw, her, I saw this other girl and I said, uh, that I knew. I said, who was that high school student you were with the other day? She said, what high school student? Walking through the quad at the college. She said, she, she's not, a, this girl's from Alabama. So she said, <clears throat> oh, I can't do a southern voice. But she said something like, She's not in high school. She's in college. Does that sound Alabama? No. Okay. <clears throat> I have a sister that lives in Alabama, a son in Georgia, a daughter in Tennessee, so I'm not making fun of the South. Okay, my wife is from Georgia, and we love the South. Spent years there. But that's how her kind of southern accent, she's not in high school. She's in college. I said, oh. And that's where it all began with that catch of the eye, right? So that's how I saw her as a very attractive 19-year-old. But her dad still sees her or would always see her as that little girl that sat in her lap. So I got a picture of my wife when she was a girl, and I've kept that handy because that's just a reminder that if I, if I get to where I'm not regarding her as the wife of my youth, if we get upset with each other or frustrated or angry, remember how her dad saw her. And now I've got two daughters. In fact, on the way here, I dropped them off at the airport in Garden City. One flew back to Tennessee. The other flew back with our six-month-old grandson to Charlottesville, Virginia. And even though they're both now very mature and married and doing very well in their families, whenever they come home, guess what I still see? I see the little girl that climbed up in the entertainment set when I was setting it up and sat there like, I'm the only TV you need. Or the other one with the full curly hair when we lived in North Florida and it was very humid and her hair would curl. That's what I still see. So if we can do that with our daughter, Solomon says, do that with your wife as well. Always remember what she gave you when she was 19 or 20 or 21. And she said, I do. And if you can remember that, that can sustain you through some of the years that get difficult. 
This is just a beautiful verse. Look at verse, um, verse 19. Always be intoxicated in her love. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman? The word there for intoxicated in some versions, I think, says lost or go astray in. And that literally is the same word as used in some of the prophets of the Old Testament to describe Israel going astray. Israel forgot God and went pursuing other false gods and wrong ways of living. Excuse me. And they strayed. They got lost. They were intoxicated with their own desires. Now, in the love relationship between a husband and a wife, Solomon says, my son, get lost in her love. When you are together and the two of you are together, the cares of the world and the, and the, the frustration of the world, at least for a few moments, can be lost in each other's embrace. And there's something very, very, very powerful in that. And as a man, I can say that, and I can't speak from the woman's perspective, but from the man's perspective, if you've ever been beat up at work and kicked and knocked down and you didn't get the account and you didn't get some things you counted on and you were put down, when you go home to that warm, welcome embrace, it does help keep the world at, at bay. It keeps the world outside. And it keeps heaven at home. So this is a powerful verse. And we want to just unpack it a little bit more and go through some things here. Before I do, I thought this was a great time to show some pictures. I did this talk in Colorado some time ago, and I took these pictures in Colorado. There's a beaver, a beaver dam. There's a little creek. I think we stuck our hands in there maybe and splashed it on our face. I'm just looking at that now, and that is just so refreshing. I shouldn't be showing this, should I? And as the sun was going down, you know, we're looking for jackets to put on, and it's in the summertime. And look at that. And then I drive across the prairie coming over here, and I look out at all those farm fields. And I look out at some of the ravines, and I'm a hunter, so I know there's deer in those ravines. I know there's coyotes out there. I know there's all kinds of animals. <clears throat> There's enough farmland out there that we farm that we feed a good part of our country. And then if I go to the ocean, I marvel at the lapping of the water, you know, as it hits the coast. I think, isn't our God just a great God? Just the beautiful country that he made, whether it's the plains, the prairie, the water, and the mountains. Our God is good. And that's what I just have to show. It's my favorite one. And every time I show it, my wife just rolls her eyes. But here's a husband, a preacher, an older preacher, driving off with his wife. And he says, this should be an enjoyable trip. I brought CDs of all my 2001 sermons. <laughs> and I just want to tell him she did not like him that much the first time. Okay? Leave the poor woman alone. Okay. A blessed fountain. <clears throat> Drink water from your own cistern, running from water from your own well. Water is a metaphor for sexual intimacy that occurs elsewhere in the Bible. And we're not going to go into all the verses that I would like to, but it goes all the way back to the beginning in Genesis 2 and verse 8, where God's plan for sexual intimacy is first revealed all the way back. When God made man and woman in his image, when God made the animals and Adam named them, when God brought the animals to, to Adam and he did name them, but then it says that, but Adam was alone. Every animal had its corresponding pair or partner. There was something for every other animal. There was the mate. There was the completion. But for man, he was all alone. And I think the Bible does that, and God tells the story in that way because it shows that as, as good as it was with God making man, it was incomplete. It was not right. And I realized how incomplete I was when I saw Cheryl the first time, and I said, maybe this is who I've been looking for. And it was, we became friends. It was probably two years before we actually had our first date. I was in graduate school. I came back on Friday nights. This was at Fruit Hardeman College. Both my brothers were there. I was going to school in Memphis, but I was a youth minister on the other side of Henderson, so I would stay the night in the dorm with my brothers. And there was a weekend devotional on Friday night and also on Saturday night. So I went, and Shira was there. And I said, I haven't talked with her in a while. So I said, would you, how about we go get a snack? Well, in Henderson, Tennessee, the only thing open at 11 o'clock at night was a truck stop. So I took her to a smoke-filled truck stop. I dug in my pockets and looked, and I had just enough for us to have <clears throat> to split an order of our Ida Tater Tots, and each of us have our own Coke. It was still too, still too soon to share a, share a straw. So we had our own drinks. And when it was done, I said, thank you, I had a good time. She said, I did too. And I said, 
this was so easy, so simple, so pleasant, there could be something here. There could be something here. I don't have a lot right now. I'm in graduate school. I can't make an impression, and she wasn't looking for one. And I realized right now that there's, there's a partner that God has for us, and this may be the one. And that's what God reveals to Adam in Genesis 2.8. You saw the grizzly bear, you saw the coyote, you saw the elk. The male of each species and the female of each species. There was something for the other, but for Adam there was not. And then when God finally <clears throat> creates the woman, he brings her in Genesis chapter 2, 22 through 24. God presented Eve to Adam, and Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken from man. And one Hebrew um, commentator said, if you could condense this into what it really means and what he's saying with powerful emotion is, wow. Okay, the first time he saw Eve, he just went, wow. Finally, someone for me. Ha ha, Mr. Elk, now I've got a partner too. And that's the beginning. That's the beginning of, of, of God's plan with, with, with human life. A man and a woman, a husband and a wife. And it was a powerful moment. Verse 25 says, The husband and the wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. That's an important sense right there. They were not ashamed. And a couple of things are happening here. Two things are going on in this first encounter between Adam and Eve, the husband and the wife. First, there is similarity and dissimilarity. Similarity means there's a likeness. Okay, he noticed that, that there's a, we're similar. Um, she's not walking on all fours. And I don't walk on all fours. Um... She doesn't have a long tail like a mountain lion, and I don't have a long tail like a mountain lion. Okay, we've, this, is, we, this is similar, okay? I don't have antlers. She doesn't have antlers. So we're, she's not in the animal kingdom. I'm not in the animal kingdom. We're, we're kind of in this thing by herself. We're, I get, we're humans. She's a human. But there's dissimilarity, too, because he would have had the muscular structure of a man, but she had the more gentle, feminine structure of a woman. And other structural differences were very apparent. And he said, there's enough of her that is just like me that she belongs to whatever category of, of biology you would put me in. But she's different enough, too, that, that she's not me. She's a woman. And she completes me. You see, when the verse in Genesis chapter 2 says that <clears throat> God says, I will make a helper suitable for man. Modern, modern feminist interpreters of the Bible, and there is a branch of theology called feminist theology. You've encountered that. And some of it is just trying to look for, you know, fairness and in interpretation of the Bible for women. And some are all out feminists and don't even regard the Bible as from the word of God. And they're looking for everything they can to criticize. They take offense at the word that God would make a helper suitable for man and it would be a woman. Because we're more than just a helper. Well, yes. But she is a helper, just like at times I hope I'm a helper to my wife, right? We help each other out. But the idea of helper is also used, that same Hebrew word is used in Psalm 121. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. So that word help in Genesis chapter 2 is also used in reference to the woman in Psalms in reference to God. Now, is anybody going to say that when God refers to himself as the help for man, that he is in a subordinate, submissive, worthless, demeaning position? Absolutely not. It's the idea of fulfilling. And she fulfills the life of the man. It is actually a very praiseworthy, complimentary term if we will allow the Bible to be able to speak and express itself without us putting our own forced interpretive grid on it today. So, similarity, she looks a lot like me, but dissimilarity, not 100%. There's enough differences that I can tell that we fill each other, fulfill each other, complement each other. Then secondly, there's also total transparency. They were both naked. They were not hiding. They couldn't hide. There was nothing to hide. And I think the idea of total transparency is, and, and being naked but not ashamed is not just that their bodies were unclothed, but do you know how we clothe our minds as well, or our, our feelings and emotions? How are you? Fine. Well, if I say it like that, you know I'm not fine. I just lied. Now, why did I lie? Because I either really don't want to talk about it, or I am so angry 
that I want you to have to pry it out of me so I can just let it pour out and gush out and show you just how angry I really am. But I am trying to keep my calm so that I don't look too angry because I want to make it look like I don't want to hurt your feelings even though you sure deserve it. <laughs> have you ever seen that before? Um, have you ever done that before? Okay, see, we mask our feelings as well as we do our bodies, don't we? Yeah, we mask our feelings as well as we do our bodies. So I think with Adam and Eve, they were totally open and honest with their bodies, but also with their feelings, their thoughts, their heart. They were open. They expressed. And what came naturally to Adam and Eve, because they were created pure and holy, is what God wants for us to have today. But whereas it came natural for them, it's a lot of hard work for us today. And it takes a lifetime. It takes a lifetime. How many of you husbands and wives that have been married for 20 more years will sometimes finish each other's sentences? How many of you get annoyed at it? You know, it can be annoying sometimes, can't it? But you know, it's also pretty neat because Cheryl knows what I'm going to say. I know what Cheryl's going to say. If it's a joke, I wish you would just go ahead and laugh at it. But instead of saying, I've heard that one, just kidding. There's some way it's complimentary because she knows how I think and she's still with me. I know how she thinks. I'm still with her. You just grow in that togetherness and that closeness. Today we have to work at it. <clears throat> and sometimes it takes a lifetime. I've known of couples that have been married 20 and 30 years before they finally said, we think we're getting what God wanted us to have. But it took that long for the Holy Spirit to be working on their hearts to soften them and to, to get rid of some of the anger and the hostility and some of the dysfunction they brought with them from their family of origin. It took that long to weed it out. And how unfortunate it is for those who after five or six years will just give up trying. And sometimes it is an impossible situation, but many times we know it's sometimes, many times it is they're just tired of trying or they don't want to try or it hurts too much to try. But I feel for them because if they, unless they dig their heels in and say, I'm here, we're going to make it work, they may never find the wow that Adam found and that God wants for all of us in marriage. They have, with the similarity and dissimilarity and total transparency, they have companionship and they have intimacy. Could anything ever disrupt so perfect a design by God? Yes. How many of you ever planned the perfect picnic and you had the fried chicken, you had the iced tea, and everything was just right, but you forgot the mosquito net? How many mosquitoes does it take to ruin a good picnic? I know that mosquitoes are not of the devil. God made them for some reason. They serve some purpose. I don't know what yet, but if there's ever something that can be disrupted, something beautiful that can be turned ugly, the devil is going to be behind it. And he is behind the disruption that we see in families. Um, <clears throat> the devil lives to disturb and disrupt. That's completely what he does, to disturb and disrupt. He is the one who throws mud on clean sheets. You know, he is the one who likes to make happy, ch happy children cry. He takes delight in seeing pure turned unholy, innocent, turned guilty. That's what he does. Adam and Eve became self-aware after the devil entered. Did God really say you couldn't eat this fruit? Don't you know it's going to make you wise like God? Now, isn't it interesting to become wise like God? Eve sinned. You see how disrupted and crazy human beings get? I want to be as smart as God is. If i got a sin to do it, I will. <laughs> If I've got to become like God who has no sin and go through sin to do it, I will do it. And that's what he did. Is that not crazy? She sinned to become sinless like God. She was already sinless. She believed the lies of the devil. And when she did and she gave to her husband, what did the first, what's the first thing they, they, they did? They took leaves and made coverings for themselves because what happened? They now became self-aware. And they said, whoa, I have a wart. I have a pimple. Where is Maybelline when you need it? Right? So they try to cover up 
their shame. Prior to this, Adam saw Eve. And she was not intimidated by his, his look, by his stare, by his, his, his taking enjoyment in looking at her. Nor did he feel in any way bothered by that with her looking at him. They were focused on the other and they were not self-aware. It was when they took of the forbidden fruit that they became aware of their inadequacies, of their humanness. And now self-defeat thinking comes in, low self-esteem comes in, all this stuff comes in, guilt and shame comes in. And now it's like we have to cover up. And when human beings try to cover up their sin, they always do an inadequate job of it, Right? They covered up with fig leaves. When God finally drove them out of the garden, what did he cover them in? Skins, in leather, in clothing. Even that is inadequate. Finally, our sins were covered how? By the blood of? We cannot cover our own sin and shame. And anytime we try to fix our own messes, we tend to make them worse. We've got to take them to the cross. They become self-aware. That starts to work at the uh, foundations of the marriage because now they're selfish. Beforehand... Adam saw Eve. Eve saw Adam. They think about the other. Wow. He say, takes such delight in her. And he, he loves her and he serves her. And she in him. She is his helper, his completer, his fulfiller. And she's not offended by that role. She's, she's not reading Gloria Steinem and the modern feminists that say, why should you be a helper to a man? Why should you do that for your husband? No, they had, she hadn't read all that stuff. She is taking delight in being delighted in by her husband and in, and, and in serving him. And he feels the same way. It is only when the devil enters that they start to go, mm, and cover up, and you hurt my feelings last night, and you didn't think of me last night, and now they become a troublesome marriage. And I'm, I'm saying troublesome, we don't know. They become a normal marriage, let's put it that way. They now become like us, where we have to work through the issues to get to where God wants us to be. Selfishness now trumps service. The fallout from the fall. Which way should I point this? That way, okay. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16. After they fall, after they sin, God now places these curses. And for the woman, it says, your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. And that's a very complicated verse. And in just a few moments, I can't go deeply into that. But it's complicated today because... Your husband's desire will be for you. Oh, no, your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. Now, doesn't that sound, well, that just sounds ominous, doesn't it? At least the latter part of it. And I remember the first time I heard this in a discussion was at a men's study group one night. And one of the, one of the men present, one of the older men said that a woman is naturally going to love her husband. And he's coming out of Genesis chapter 2 and verse 22 through 24 where God made them, and Adam goes, wow, and they delight in each other. But this is post-fall. Okay, now this word for desire, the Hebrew word, it's used three times in the Old Testament. It's used here as your desire will be for your husband. It's used in Genesis chapter 4 and verse, I think it's verse 4, or verse 7, where it says, God comes to Cain and says, sin is crouching at the door, it desires to have you. Sin desires to have Cain. Then there is another verse in Song of Songs, chapter 7, about verse 4 or 5, where it's a honeymoon scene. This husband and wife are on their honeymoon, and she's ready to receive her husband, and she says, and his desire is for me. Well, if you've been married, you know what that is. They've gotten married, and he loves her, and they're going to be together. His desire is for his wife, and it's pure and holy, but it's also it's romantic, it's very physical, and it's a beautiful scene of a young couple, be, of a couple being married. It's a love poem, a married love poem. So we know what this word means in two places. In Song of Songs, it means loving, romantic desire of husband for wife. You know what it means in Genesis chapter 4, about 7 or 8? Verse 7, where it means competition. Sin desires to have you. It wants to control you. The devil wants to destroy you. But God is competing for you as well. So the devil and, the God, and God are competing for the heart and soul of Cain. So desire there means competition. So means romance, 
or it means competition. Now let's take it back to Genesis 3.16, where God tells Eve, your desire will be for your husband. What does it mean? Does it mean romantic love? Or now the innocence and purity and sincerity and service-mindedness of marriage before the fall is now changing. And the natural role of a husband and wife and complimenting, complimenting each other just so naturally is now going to be very, very complicated because now there's going to be competition. Now we're going to be keeping score. Now we're going to be remembering what the other did to hurt us. Now we're going to be trying to get the upper hand. Now we're going to be saying, why didn't you fill the gas tank before you left the car with me? Nobody else here has that discussion at your house? Well, let me tell you about it. Um, I think it's competition. Your desire is going to be for your husband. The roles that God gave us to play at the beginning are disrupted by the devil, and we now are not so willing to fulfill what God wants for our life. And if you doubt that, watch the news. It's the world. We don't want to live the way God calls us to live. 87 people shot in Chicago over the 4th of July weekend. A number of small children killed in Atlanta, Chicago, and New York. Why would someone use the weekend that we honor freedom to deny someone else their freedom and take their life? If you doubt the power of sin to disrupt us and make us live contrary to the way God calls us to live, just watch the news. So I think what Genesis 3.16 is, is a warning. Husbands and wives, be careful. Because the normal roles are now disrupted and there's going to be competition. Who's going to rule in this home? Whose desire will prevail? And we have to work today. Where do I point? In? There we go. <clears throat> What spirit will prevail in the home? Selfish pursuit or service? A big question. There's a writer called um, Bruce, Bruce Waltke. He writes a lot of stuff on Proverbs, and he's one of my favorite guys to read on Proverbs. And if you read one of my books, you'll see I quote him a number of times. One of his famous quotes on Proverbs is, the wise person disadvantages himself to advantage the community. But the foolish person disadvantages the community to advantage himself. When I was growing up, we always had turkey for Thanksgiving and for Christmas. The later years, we changed it, I think, to ham or something. But Thanksgiving was always turkey. And after we, grew, we left home, all the kids would come back. Thanksgiving was our get-together time. And all the men had the, the, the dark meat. We shared the legs and the thighs. My little sister didn't like the, the dark meat, and my mother didn't like the dark meat, we thought. But my dad and two brothers and I, we liked the dark meat. So we got the dark, and the women got all the white. But later, we would cut it up for sandwiches and eat it on sandwiches. But on the day of the meal, men got the dark meat. As we were all married and started having our kids, we'd come back. Turkey's cut. We're passing the tray. Who would like what? Mom says, I'll take a leg. I'm 30 years old. I haven't eaten turkey with you for 30 years. You have never had a leg. What's going on? And maybe in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, okay, am I going to have to get the white meat because she's getting my leg? What's happening here? But she says, I have always liked dark, the dark meat. But you boys liked the dark meat, so I just ate the white. But now you're old enough, I think I can start eating dark meat in my house again. And we said, you sure can, Mom. Well, you talk about a lesson in service. All those years, we never knew. She never said a thing. She ate the less of what she really wanted so the rest of us could have what we wanted. She disadvantaged herself to advantage the family, the community. And that's what the wise person does. That's the theme of Proverbs. And that's what husbands and wives do in their marriages. So how do we do that? How do we advantage our home? especially our marriage. And remember the opening verses we read, keep your love at home. Should your water overflow in the, in the streets? The idea there is drink water from your own cistern. Water there is a metaphor for sexuality. Go back and enjoy your wife, not someone else's wife. And there's four chapters in Proverbs, 2, 5, 6, and 7, that address in detail the problems of adultery and what happens to you if you get lost in adultery. 
That's why Solomon says, get lost in love to your wife. Don't get lost in love to someone else. That's truly being lost. Get lost in love to your husband or your wife in the throes of romantic love. It's good, it's wholesome, it's happy, it's healthy there. So, drink water from your own cistern. Should your springs overflow in the street? The idea of springs here could be that why should you go drink water somewhere else? But it could also be springs overflowing. Have you ever been or seen a flood? Have you ever been to a flood? I've been to two floods where I actually had to be rescued by a boat. It was not in Kansas. Certainly not Ulysses, Kansas. Okay, we get two inches there, it seems like a flood. But water within the banks is very helpful, very healthy, very good. Water out of the banks is very destructive. The idea of springs overflowing in the streets, if the husband's not drinking water from the well at home, his wife may be starved and she overflows the banks and looks for love somewhere else. And it destroys, both of them are working against the good of the marriage. So the idea of water at home, keep the water in the banks, keep your love at home. And how do we do that? Well, there's a counselor that wrote a book on, um, on uh, okay, I thought that was the section leading up to this. Where's the projector? Rah, that would help. Okay, sexual thirst is quenched at home with one husband or wife. And there's a guy that's written a book called Five Basic Needs of, that's not the name of the book, that's the chapter by Willard Harley. Five Basic Needs of Husbands, and they are, Number one, sexual fulfillment. Number two, recreational companionship. Um, if your husband likes hunting and he says, honey, why don't you just ride through the country with me? Um, he really does want you with him. He, he really does want you with him. Um, I've taken my, my wife doesn't actually go hunting with me, but I'll, I've taken her through some of my hunting territories. We're going somewhere. And one time we were going out to dinner with another re family. We were like an hour late. So now if I say, hey, would you like to ride through some of, no. <laughs> okay, we have a little more time, we're early. Can we ride through this time? Sure. Okay, but that means something to a husband. Recreational companionship. Um, she would come watch when I played softball when we were first married. You know, you're married. What does it mean for her to sit in the stands to watch you play softball? She saw me get a triple. Right? She saw me catch that grounder. I'm 24 and I can still do it. All right? So, yeah, that means something to a guy. Um, attractiveness in his wife. And it doesn't mean that you think it's attractive necessarily, but that he does. Understand the way I'm saying that. The reason I first asked Cheryl out, it's the attractiveness that a man sees in the woman that first makes him ask first leads him to ask her out, but then it's the attractiveness of her character that keeps him asking her out. When I first saw Cheryl walking with Regina, I didn't talk to her. I didn't know anything about her background. I just knew she looked cute to me. She was attractive to me. But it's after I talked with her and I found out she grew up in a home like I did, she had desires like I did for family, that I said, wow. Okay, the attractiveness I see on the outside is but the is just but what, what you can see, you know, easily see, but it's the attractiveness on the inside that really draws the husband to the wife. And when you have that inner attractiveness, then the outer attractiveness takes on even greater intensity and, and keenness. And you know, as we get older and we age, and we think, oh man, I, you know, I'm, I don't look 20 anymore. Well, you're 60 now. To, his, to her husband, she is just as attractive as when she was 20, still is. And when my wife takes the care to put something on that she knows I like, it just makes my heart go Phew, still. And some of you husbands are smiling, you know what I'm talking about. That's meaningful to a, to a husband. Number four, domestic support. And number five, admiration from his wife. You know, if three people at church tell me that was just about the worst sermon that I ever heard, but my wife says, oh, I thought it was good, then those others can think what they want to. You know? She, now, I appreciate her honesty. Because so if I ask, what did you think of the lesson? She'll say, well, I really don't know what you meant by that, that story you told. 
That, that makes me stop and think, okay, do I need to tell that one again? Because I really do run a lot of things by her. Her honesty and is meaningful because when she does admire something that I've done, I know it's very honest. Then there are the five basic needs of wives. And this is what he has gotten from 30 years of counseling and listening to people in his office. Affection. That doesn't necessarily mean um, complete, full romance at night or full expression of sexuality. It can be holding hands, talking. Number two, conversation. Number three, honesty and openness. Number four, financial support. And number five is family commitment from her husband. Family commitment, meaning that I am going to put the family above other things. And it takes a while for a husband to learn that one, doesn't it? It takes a while for us to learn it. Um, shortly after we were married, we woke up early one morning, and I don't remember if I didn't lock the door that night or what, but we heard voices early one Saturday morning in our living room. And it was my brother and my best friend from college. They drove down from Tennessee to North Florida. They drove all night, got in early in the morning, and I woke up Saturday morning, and there they were. Well, I just thought that was the neatest thing ever. So we spent the weekend target shooting, driving out in the country, playing basketball. And it was Sunday night after church. We were going out to play basketball with some of the guys from church. And as I'm walking out the door, I turned. Her, my, my wife and her mom were sitting there, and I turned around. And I said, oh, do you mind if I go? And she just smiled and said, no. And right then I realized, I'm still being a kid. And she was patient with me through that. But she knew that I had family commitment. If I had kept that up all the time, you know, we only have three kids. Can't you take care of them while I go play basketball with the guys? I'm only 45. You know, I'm still young. Somehow we've got to, get, we've got to outgrow that. May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth, verse 18. God plans for the marriage to go for the duration. And my, I do marriage counseling. I don't, I'm not a marriage counselor. I, I prefer to call it marriage conversation because um, I'm not trained as a counselor, but obviously Wayne and Steve will tell you, Matt, that when you're in ministry and people come by your office, you wind up doing a lot of marriage counseling. And we take classes for it. But... My heart breaks for some of those that come in, and I know they want to make it work. But there's often one of them in the party that doesn't, one of them in the marriage, and the other one's left heartbroken, and it's not what they had planned. It's not what they wanted. Their heart is broken, and God is too. God's is too. He wants the marriage to last. And fortunately, we have a God of grace who, when our marriages don't last, God still loves us. You know, we have those passages in the Old Testament about those who cannot enter the temple. If they're from certain places, they can't. If they have injury to the body, they can't. You know, God wanted the purity and the wholeness of the animal to be offered in the sacrifice and of the people entering the temple to receive the sacrifice. But later in Isaiah, he says the halt and the maimed and those who have in body injuries, the day is coming when what? They will be welcome into the temple as well. So there is no brokenness in our life that God cannot somehow redeem. We may still have the hurt and the shame and the aloneness in, in the sense of not having that companion with us, but we can still have the love and the forgiveness and the redemption of God in a relationship with Jesus. So thank God for that. We've all done things that leave us hurt and scarred and maybe broken, but we also have a God who fixes. So I remember... My dad being very, very strict on us when we were younger, telling us boys about how careful we better be in dating a girl. Never do something with a girl that's going to embarrass her and that's going to make it uncomfortable for the two of you to talk later. You know, you bump into this girl five years later. You don't want to have a whole bunch of stuff here that you've got to be very uncomfortable about and lie about. You don't want to embarrass her in front of her dad. You know, date a girl so that when you're done with your dating, if she's not the one you marry, you're still going to be able to be friends because it was honorable. And all these lessons that he taught, and even my grandfather taught some of those. All of his grandsons, he gave us some very, very dire warnings. He worked in a hospital in New York City back in the 30s and 40s before they had some of the advanced treatments for venereal, venereal diseases. He worked in some of those wards, and he would tell us stories. He'd get his grandsons together and say, boys, let me tell you what I saw. we go, whoa. He said, you want to have that happen to you? I said, no way. 
Well, you wait until you're married, son, let me tell you. He scared me to death. What he was trying to do is to keep our minds oriented to what God wanted. He did it in a very streetwise way, but he wanted us to be on course with God and to honor the woman that we were dating so that we would be able to honor her as a wife or some other man would be able to fully honor her as a wife. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. Sometimes along the path to getting to that wife or getting to that husband, we do some things we are ashamed of and embarrassed about. Thankfully, we have the Lord who forgives us and can restore us. And that is good news. So if we are carrying scars because this lesson reminds us of how it's not being fulfilled in our lives, that's what Jesus is for. That's what the church here is for. It's to welcome the heart sick and the broken and the pained and the grieved. But in the meantime, we do have this passage to drink from. We do have this passage to draw from, to learn from, so that our marriages can be what we want them to be. Uh, Maybe my last slide on this. Okay, fountain be blessed could refer to children, but we know, in fact, it refers to a state of well-being because that's used elsewhere. May your fountain be blessed. May your marriage be a place of well-being for you and eventually a place for your children as well. A loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be captivated by her love. After being married even 38 years, it's still amazing to me how much the attraction that drew us together, and you know as well, 30 and 40 years ago, still draws us together. In a touch, a kiss, a pat on the back, you know, a stroke on your forearm, that can still just bring back that, that old flame, okay, because this is the person that God gave me. This is the one I chose. This is the one who said yes. And may that, that sense of connection and love captivate you and never let you go. That's Solomon's prayer for his son. That was my wife's and my prayer for all three of our children. And that's your prayer for your children. And now that we have two grandchildren, guess what we're praying for now? that eventually it comes to fulfillment in the lives of our grandsons. And our daughter-in-law is pregnant. We don't know yet if it's a girl or a boy. But guess what? We're going to be praying for him or her. The same thing. What time do you guys end? Any time. I think we're at the end. I like this quote from a friend of mine. Sexuality provides the means by which a husband and wife bond together, enjoy each other, and celebrate their communion. And that's what Proverbs 5 is about. And that's what Genesis 2 is about. And we'll close by me asking, are there any questions? Comments? And if you ever make it out to Ulysses, stop and say hi. We'd be glad to have you. And um, come visit us some Sunday. We are, we got pretty small because we had a lot of people move away, but we did some things at the uh, first part of this year to try to re, um, reinvigorate the congregation. And we added five new families um, between, say, December and first part of February. Five families from our community, all with between two to five children each. And I mean, it just, you talk about changing a church like that, where you go from very few children to, you know, five families with two each. There's about 15 new children in the church building running down the hallways on Sunday. It just brought life like you wouldn't believe. Then COVID hit. We've had quarantine. Three of the five families have come back at least once. So just pray for us that those young families keep coming. And I know you're praying the same thing for your church here. But... um, God will be with us and bless us, and thank you for your time. And again, uh, Warren, we want to thank you for coming to uh, Eastwood here tonight and and blessing us through your study uh, from uh, God's Word and your honesty and sincerity with us. Let's let's sing a a song together. Give me the Bible. We're going to do first and third verses together here this evening, then I'll close us out with a prayer. 
Give me the Bible, star of gladness gleaming, to cheer the wonder, lone and tempest tossed. No storm can hide that radiance peaceful beaming, since Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Give me the Bible, holy message shining, Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combining, till night shall vanish in eternal day. Give me the Bible, lamp of life immortal, hold up that splendor by the open grave. Show me the light from heaven's shining portal. Show me the glory gilding Jordan's wave. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combining. Till night shall vanish in eternal day. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the opportunity to be able to come here tonight. Father, to study from your word and to be encouraged by brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, we do thank you for Warren and uh, allowing him to safely come over to Hutchinson, Kansas and bless us through this study here tonight and pray for his study tomorrow morning with our men's class and please give him a safe trip back home to his family. Father, we do pray for our brothers and sisters in Ulysses and pray for uh, the, their church leaders and the guidance through these very difficult and challenging COVID-19 times and, and we just pray for uh, outreach and spiritual growth and maturity for their congregation. Father, we also bring up all of those that we mentioned before earlier, those that were just great successes and thank yous and praises and hallelujah unto your name, just seeing your powerful hand at work in their life and others that are suffering with very, very serious life issues at this time. And we're praying for your healing and your mercy. Father, thank you again for allowing us to be here tonight. It's in Jesus that we pray. Amen. You're dismissed. Yes. Yes.